If you do this with your come from, your heart is in the right place, literally. And this is about serving them, not pitching them. It is about helping them rather than selling them. They will pick up that energy. And I'm the least woo-woo person in the world, Steve. I don't believe in crystals and, you know, incense and all of this. But man, oh man, in the sales conversation, prospects and salespeople, right? Prospects pick up the salesperson's energy. Salesperson also picks up the prospect's energy. And so this is really, really important. You have carte blanche permission to ask all of these questions that I'm giving you if your come from is in the right spot. This is Outside Sales Talk, the best podcast for outside salespeople. I'm your host, Steve Benson, and we're here to chat with the world's top sales experts so that you can get their best sales tactics to level up your game. Welcome back to Outside Sales Talk. Today, I have David Newman with us, and he's the author of Do It Selling, where you learn to land better clients, bigger deals, and higher fees. David, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Steve. It's great to be here. Well, just by way of introduction, David is a certified speaking professional, and he's a member of the NSA Million Dollar Speakers Group. He helps consultants and business coaches grow their revenue by 50% to 500% in less than 15 months. He's presented over 600 keynotes and seminars since 1992 and has worked with 44 of the Fortune 500 companies. He's got some other best-selling books as well. There's Do It Marketing, Do It Speaking, but today we're going to be we're going to be focused on uh, Do It Selling in today's podcast. So welcome to the show, David. This is really fantastic to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are we driving along? Are we are we on the highway? Where are we right now? <laughs> Good. Good guess. Most of our listeners are are uh, are in their cars when they listen. We've we've found from from our uh, our our basic surveying techniques, um, and uh, you know because they're field salespeople, and so they're they're looking to learn more about outside sales, uh, and they're they're generally in their cars. Totally so, fantastic. So you know, first question: How come so many professionals and professional service firms uh, avoid sales activity in a certain respect? Sure. So, well, and, and that's my world is the professional services sales, but I also speak to and work with folks that are doing product sales and other sorts of things. Uh, it's interesting. There was a survey done, and I'm not sure it was Selling Power magazine or one of these other magazines, but they asked full time professional salespeople in a 40 hour work week, how many hours do you actually spend on sales activity? And Steve, you might've seen the results of this survey. It was shockingly low. It was like eight to 10, eight to 10 hours a week. I'm on the phone with prospects. I'm visiting prospects. I'm connecting with prospects. I'm emailing prospects. I'm sending everything else was non-selling activity. And now let's take this into my world of professional services firms. So law firms, accounting firms, consulting firms of all different sizes. And now we have a whole class of people that think, well, my job is doing the work. It's not about getting the work. And here's the newsflash, people, and most of the folks listening will, will resonate with this. Newsflash, your job is about getting the work, even if part of your work is doing the work. So when it comes to sales activity and prospecting activity, uh, you know, it's it's amazing. Even some full-time professional salespeople, they avoid the prospecting. They're like, could my sales assistant do this? Could my, could my uh, executive assistant do this? Could they make that first call? Could they you know, maybe set up some visits for me? And it's like, wow, we, we want to delegate this. We want to offload this. We want to outsource this as fast as humanly possible. In my opinion, the salesperson is the very best person to be doing this. And primarily because if you don't like doing it and you never got good at doing it, it's really tough to delegate something that you don't know how it's supposed to work. So I would say, listen, 
if you've already set up a thousand appointments and you know how this works forwards, backwards, and inside out, then you can train your sales assistant. Then you can train your executive admin person to do the first couple of steps. But you know, most people just like, no, no, put me in front of prospects. Put me in front of prospects, coach, put me in. You know, the more people I talk to, the better, but they don't want to do the work to get the invitation to the conversation that puts them in front of that prospect. And, you know, how many salespeople, Steve, say, man, if I could just get in front of more prospects, that's my big, you know, once I get them, once we're talking, it's game over. I close 70%, I close 80%, I'm awesome, but get me into more conversations. So wouldn't you think that if that were the case, that their number one priority, where they spend most of their time, would be getting more appointments and booking more calls. But this is the part they totally avoid. So it's just kind of funny in that way. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and I, I think uh, what one of the best things to do if you're in that sort of situation is have a professional salesperson. Um, and, and I would even break it up further into professional kind of lead generation appointment setting separate from the actual um, professional salesperson. Sometimes you can combine those those jobs depending on depending on the industry, depending on the size of the company. But you'll you'll get efficiencies from splitting them out. And and uh, you know if you're a consulting firm, maybe you have certain people who are going to be better at selling the the selling the product to new and and finding new prospects and customers and closing them than doing you know doing the actual consulting work, right? But it, it sure For helps. Sure. If, Sure helps if they have a background in that consulting stuff, but right. Well, and also in the consulting world, in the professional services world, we call these people rainmakers, right? That's the term, rainmaker. It's like, oh, you know, he's the maybe he's one of the principals in the consulting firm, but man, oh man, he's got the breakfast, the lunches, the coffees. He's got the rolodex. He's got the network. Young kids, if you're not not sure what a rolodex is, look it up. It's on Wikipedia. You'll enjoy it. Um, but that's, that is absolutely the case, Steve, is that sometimes the professional services, uh, the more senior people are the rainmakers. And, uh, sometimes that doesn't, that ethos doesn't go down to the younger generation. And so they kind of resist it. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of this, you often see the people that are good in, in many organizations at selling rise to the top of the organization right? yes. over, over the years. It's like, well. Jessica closed that massive deal, you know, three years ago, and she just keeps bringing in more deals. And so, you know, she's the one that now runs that team because guess, yeah. guess who the the owners of the company care about? They care about closing the deals and bringing in That's more deals. Right. So, yeah, you especially see that in like law firms. I remember my sister joined a law firm, um, you know, this is years ago, uh, you know, right after she graduated law school and I was, and I was trying to teach her about sales and how you know, how to get in front of people and generate business. Cause that's not something they ever talked about in, in law school. But I knew with my background that that was going to be absolutely critical to her career. Right. So it's, it kind and there's of, a lot of technology folks. I mean, a lot of technology folks, you look at people like sales engineers, it's like they take the engineer part very seriously. They don't take the sales part all that seriously. And that's, you know, that's sort of the DNA marker of a of a successful salesperson. You know, I want to also you, one of the things I talk about in the do it selling book is reframing even for professional salespeople. Uh much less these rainmakers and folks that are sort of somewhat involved in sales. But if for some reason sales has not left a great taste in your mouth, it's probably because of bad sales training or bad sales process or bad sales people that we've been on the receiving end of, and you're like, oh, I don't wanna be pushy. I don't wanna be salesy. I don't wanna interrupt strangers. I don't wanna seem spammy. You know, if I'm going on LinkedIn, I'm making calls, I'm sending emails. I don't wanna be seen as that guy or that gal. And one of the prime concepts early on in the Do It Selling book, I say, forget about all of that. Uh, think about an invitation to a conversation. So who's afraid of an invitation? Generally, good things happen once you get an invitation. It involves a party or cake or bourbon or barbecue or something. So people generally are not afraid to send or receive invitations. And then invitation to what? To a conversation 
Second part of this, most people are not afraid of a conversation. What happens in a conversation? We meet new people. We exchange ideas. That's how friendships start. Maybe some of those friendships become commercialized and it's your new next client. Maybe some of those end up in a referral. Maybe some of those end up in an introduction. Maybe some of those end up as a center of influence that's going to impact your career for years and years and years to come. So most people are also not afraid of a conversation. So if your pipeline isn't what it needs to be and you are resisting some of this initial prospecting activity for whatever reason, I would invite you to reframe this as the question, are you sending enough invitations to conversations to the right kind of people to see if you can help them? And then the other thing that we spend a lot of time talking about in the book is discovery. Sales discovery, I think, this is the magic. So when, when outside salespeople lose a deal, they go, oh, I'm terrible at closing. I got to get better at negotiating. My, my negotiating was terrible. That's why I lost the deal. Or, you know, I let them get away without making a commitment, without signing on the dotted line. I got to get better at firm commitment and closing skills. It's none of those things. When you didn't close the deal, in extreme, extreme likelihood is that you didn't open the conversation the right way. You didn't dig far enough or hard enough. Uh, you didn't get to the issues behind the issues or the questions behind the questions or the challenges behind the challenges. And here's the deal. Prospects have a layer of self-soothing delusions. I, I call it self-soothing delusions. I'm, I'm very kind about this. I don't say prospects lie, although some prospects do lie, but prospects have... A, a, it's, a, it's a defense mechanism, and we all have it because we're all human, right? We, we don't want to seem dumb. We don't want to seem weak. We don't want to seem uh, less than. We don't want to seem less capable. So they will tell you, no matter how horrible the problem is that your product or service solves, they will go, well, it's not that bad. And, you know, we have a pretty good handle on it now. And, you know, we we you know hired someone last year, and that wasn't a total disaster, so there's this layer of self-soothing delusion, sometimes arrogance, sometimes complacency. And then the question I get from salespeople is, well, David, how do, we, how do we bust through that? What do we say? What do we pitch? How do we make our offer to bust through that? You don't do any of those things. No pitch, no offer. You don't say anything. You know what you do? You ask. Because salespeople are judged far more on the questions that we ask than on the statements that we make. So one of your jobs, the great Peter Drucker, who's a legendary um, consultant from the 1950s and 60s, Peter Drucker, he also wrote a whole a big bunch of books. He says, my only two skills as a consultant are I have, uh, I am strategically dumb and perpetually curious. <laughs> and by strategically dumb, what that means is when someone drops some some fact on you. So like, Steve, our our employee retention numbers are not where they need to be. Most most salespeople make the mistake of going, uh-huh, OK, got it. They make a note retention, not where they want it to be. You and I have no idea what that means. So Drucker and you and me, and these questions are in the Do It Selling book if you want the framework for how to do this discovery. We got 17 more questions when we hear that. So that, you know, I'm curious, where, where is your attention now? Where has it been? Where, if you do nothing right now, where do you think it's going to end up? Uh, what have you tried to fix? Uh, how, I'm sorry, what have you done to try and fix it so far? Why hasn't that worked? Interesting. And what else? The magic question. And what else? And what else? And what else? Right? Peel the onion, peel the onion, peel the onion. Who else is that impacting besides you and the team right here? So think about the investigative journalist questions. Who, what, why, when, where, except add the word else. So who else? Where else? When else? Why else? How else? How else is this having an impact? How is it impacting you personally? How is it impacting you professionally? 
How is this impacting you financially? Now, people would think when they see this list of questions in the Do It Selling book, they're going to say, whoa, 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 whoa. This sounds like an interrogation. I'm not going to ask 17 follow-up questions when the guy just says, hey, our retention numbers are not where they need to be. And I agree with you. You're not going to ask these interrogation style. What's the difference between an interrogation and a deeply caring, concerned, trusted advisor? The deeply caring, concerned, trusted advisor, which all salespeople are, or all salespeople should aspire to be, the come from is completely different. When we interrogate, an interrogation is a rapid fire series of questions with very little listening going on. When you are, think of this like a 60 minutes interview. So if you're an investigative journalist, you are asking out of genuine curiosity. You want to find out what's going on. You're like a scientist trying to unpack this machine called your prospect and what makes them tick and what's broken and what levers can we fix and how can we show them that there's a better way and how can we start to engineer a little bit of a better solution so that things work better for them. If you do this with your come from, your heart is in the right place, literally. And this is about serving them, not pitching them. It is about helping them rather than selling them. They will pick up that energy. And I'm the least woo-woo person in the world, Steve. I don't believe in crystals and you know incense and all of this. But man, oh man, in the sales conversation, prospects and salespeople, right? Prospects pick up the salesperson's energy. Salesperson also picks up the prospect's energy. And so this is really, really important. You have carte blanche permission to ask all of these questions that I'm giving you if your come from is in the right spot. Yeah, I'm not too woo either, but nothing gets my chakras going like some good qualification questions. <laughs> I uh, I think it, it's it's important it's important to especially for people that maybe aren't their whole job isn't to be a professional seller, but even for professional sellers to to keep in mind the the difference between prospecting, discovery and and qualification and it's it's these discover and, and you're you know basically talking about discovery questions and qualification questions and and uh and how to peel back those layers it's it's funny i actually just joined a, a call it was it, it was it was uh the, our sales team has a weekly meeting and i i usually don't join it um the the vp of sales runs that call but i i joined this week because um, I wanted to kind of teach one lesson on, on, on kind of qualification and discovery. That's probably worth repeating here. Um, it just jumped out at me that, that right now, you know, with the economy and everything, I think it's, you know, people are hesitant to bring in new products, hesitant to make changes, hesitant to have new initiatives, but really now, we need them now most people need it now more than ever, right? Now's the time to, to, to make things work better, function better. And so what I was teaching my, uh, my sales team is, is, is kind of a, make sure you, a strategy to make sure you have all the decision makers at the table and, and, and because having the right people at the table can be the difference between, you know, getting a deal and not, uh, getting the deal. And so it's kind of, it's kind of a form of qualification, qualifying that, you know, you've, you're talking to the right people. So, what I what I taught him to do basically was ask the, when you're towards the end of a, a call with a prospect, you know, that you and you feel like they understand the value, they understand what you're, you know, that you, the discovery went well, they have a need, and 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 they're they seem excited, but you as a salesperson might not feel like you're talking to the person who has the power at the table, who has who has the decision making authority necessarily. Uh, so what you can you can kind of set it up by saying something like, "Well, you know, with where the economy's at right now, it's it's harder than ever to bring in new initiatives and uh, new technology. In our case, it's technology. But um, you know, I'm seeing across all my across all my clients. You know, whenever they want to bring in uh, something new, it's really it's important right now to align with a specific 
departmental or company OKR or KPI or goal, a uh, goal of some kind. Otherwise, it's really hard to to get the you know get it through get everything through all the the gauntlet of challenges to getting things done in, in big organizations. Um, so, it, Mr. Prospect, in in your opinion, which priority do we do we best align with right now? Like this initiative of of bringing this in, and then they answer blah blah blah, and then you say, okay, well, um, that makes a ton of sense. That's the priority. What who's the person responsible for making that priority successful? And 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 hopefully they know who who it is and whose OKR that is or whose KPI it is. And then the magic question at the end is, so what's the best way to get them involved? And and that can pull, that can kind of, it's a very nice way of, you know, qualify, qual bringing the right people to the table without saying, I don't think you're the guy, but it's a way of like getting the guy right. to the table. Right, right. That is really good. I like that a lot. Well, you you can keep that. You can put it in your next book. That's for you. That's there you go. <laughs> Thank you. That's a very generous gift. Tremendous. But but, uh, but yeah. So what? So on. I, I guess we've kind of been focused on discovery and qualification. What about what about the, the other missing piece that you talked about? Prospecting. What? Let's talk. About what? What? What's the secret there? Oh how my can goodness! Prospecting can you make? How can you make that easier? How can that? That's often the piece that I see so many professional sellers, especially when their organization hasn't teased it out, you know, and made made it someone's job to hammer prospecting all day. You see companies that are like, "Oh, this is the marketing team, and they run the ads and make the content and do the market, you know, decide what buses to put billboards on, and and this is the sales team. They're in charge of closing the deal." And, and there's a big hole in the middle called prospecting. Right, exactly. Well, so the first piece of prospecting advice, which is probably not going to be revolutionary, although very few people do it, is uh, research. Research, my friends. So people say, when we, when you can equate this with whatever word you like. Some people say, hey, let's talk about marketing. They go, oh, no, I, I hate marketing because I don't like cold calls. Let's talk about selling. Oh, no, I don't like selling because I don't like cold calls. Whatever the answer is, it's I don't like blank because I don't like cold calls. Uh, what is it that takes, because every, every sale, and if you think back to yourself as a regular human being, take off your salesperson hat, you're now just a regular human being. As a buyer, right, we are buyers as well as sellers. Everything you have ever bought and everything that you have ever sold of any significance, maybe not a pack of gum or something, uh, there had to be an initial conversation. The initial conversation can be stone cold, uh, lukewarm, or somewhat warm, maybe even approaching hot. What is the difference between stone cold outreach and intelligent prospecting? And we have a whole section on intelligent prospecting in the Do It Selling book. It is research, it is relevance, and it is relationship. So think about think about ourselves as prospects. And you know, LinkedIn is the worst, the worst possible breeding ground of this horrible kind of outreach. Uh, it's like connect and spam, connect and spam, connect and spam. When we get a connect and spam, we get a random phone call, we get a random email from someone we've never heard of. Every prospect, including you and me, every prospect asks themselves three questions about this particular outreach. Why this? Why me? Why now? So I get all kinds of spam on LinkedIn and on email and sometimes even phone calls. It says, hey, David. Uh, could you connect me with the right person over there at Do It Marketing that's in charge of your PBX phone system? And I'm like, you have done no research about our company whatsoever. So my phone system, for the folks uh, listening at home, this is my phone system. It is an iPhone 11 Pro Max. It's really great. Uh, we have a distributed team. We have folks all over the world. And uh, we don't have an office. We don't have a building. There's no PBX phone system. So that was the three fails. Why me? Why this? Why now? Fail, fail, fail. Let's say I get 
a different piece of outreach because someone does, I don't know, 15 minutes of research on me or on do it marketing. I'm going to do an imaginary spam message, not spam, but imaginary. It, it could be perceived as spam because it's like just over the transom on LinkedIn. But let's say it said this. Hey, David, I see that you have two previous best-selling books, and it looks like your new book is coming out right now. We're an Amazon marketing agency, and we work with seasoned authors like you to make sure that your book gets the respect, recognition, and reviews it deserves. Worth a quick chat? Question mark. Now, if you're me at this particular point in time, Steve, where we're recording this podcast, I would totally take that call. Never heard of them, never heard of the company, never heard of them, but let's go back to our three questions. Why this? Because they did 15 minutes of research, they realized they got two books, right? Why me? Well, because I'm the author of the book. Why now? Because I'm in book launch mode. As you know, any nonfiction business book author, when they're in book launch mode, they're buying everything. They're throwing money like a drunken <laughs> sailor. Six months ago, I would not have taken that call. Probably six months from now, I will not take that call again. But the right thing at the right time for the right person, and it takes 15 minutes of research. So then people say uh, to me, Steve, they say, well, David, where, where do we do this research? This sounds really hard. This sounds really complex. And of course, it depends on what you're selling. So if you're selling widgets for 50 cents, you can't research every widget buyer who's going to buy your thing for 50 cents. That, if you're that, a wholesale that, widget that person. sold on Amazon anyway at this point. Exactly. So. But here's what you do. If it's a company of any size, you go to their website, you go to their media page, you go to their press releases, you check out all their executives on LinkedIn, you search the business journal in their local city to see if they've been reviewed, covered, won some awards. You go to the business section of their major metropolitan newspaper. So I'm in Philadelphia. We have the Philadelphia Inquirer. If you're in New York, you've got the New York Post, the New York Times. You've got the Chicago Sun, the Chicago Tribune. You know how this goes. So business section of the local paper where the headquarters is. Where have they been featured? Where have they been interviewed? You go to listennotes.com. Steve and I know about Listen Notes because Listen Notes is the podcast search engine. Have their executives been interviewed on any podcasts? What did they say are their priority? And I love what you said there earlier, Steve. What are their strategic initiatives? What are their priorities? What are they proud of? What are they working on? What are they worried about? What market forces, both positive and negative, are they going through right now where your product, your service could be exactly the right thing? And when you do that 15 minutes of research and you customize that, notice that my example of the outreach message was very short, like three sentences. Are they likely to respond because you've totally knocked it out of the park? Why me? Why this? Why now? A plus, A plus, A plus you will get that appointment. So such an important strategy and, and so, so worth the time, right? When you're approaching a, you know, a really great prospect, uh, you know, if you tell, if you tell people those three things, why me, why this, why now? I mean, it, it, it they, if, if the answer is yes to all those things, then they want to talk to you. Right. So I, I guess that's, that's, so that's prospecting. So I guess we've covered, Discovery, qualification, prospecting. What what else can can make sales easier? What can make salespeople better? So salespeople have a really bad habit of talking. <laughs> this could be the understatement of the century. Um, we rarely talk ourselves into a sale. We usually listen ourselves into a sale. So the very first question when you have that first meeting. I recommend the very first question is, tell me a little bit about your professional journey with this problem, with this issue, and where it's been and where it is today. And then we'll spend the rest of our time talking about where this might go. Why is this a good opening question? It gets the prospect talking. Uh, very wise, ancient Chinese uh, sales wisdom from a fortune cookie. 
A prospect who is listening is not a prospect. When I first heard this, Steve, I was like, prospect who's listening is not a prospect. Oh, a prospect who is talking is a prospect. So literally in the first 10 seconds, your job is to get them talking about their favorite person, them and their favorite topic, their situation, their company, their team, their technology, their problems, uh, their goals, their outcomes, what they want to do. Second question, second kind of secret sauce question that you want to use. Okay, got it. Great. Very helpful. Thank you for sharing that. Steve, do you mind if for the purpose of our conversation today, may I treat you like a fee paid client? Now, all those words are important. May I treat you like a fee paid, meaning you've already paid money, you've already bought our product, you've already bought our service. May I treat you like a fee paid client? This is a pattern interrupt and some people go, oh, well, sure. But most of them will then ask, what does that mean? And the answer is, well, what that means is if we had already started working together, then I would have permission to interrupt. I would have permission to redirect our conversation if I feel that it's not serving you in the best possible way. And I will tell you what you need to hear, not necessarily what you want to hear. Are you okay with that? Yes, that would be great. So right away, you're setting the table that let's pretend we're already working together, right? Just act as if we're already working together. And the mantra that I have in the Do It Selling book is the more you treat prospects like clients or like customers, the more customers you will get. Because why, why, why say, hey, listen, hire me, buy from me. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be amazing. Don't tell them that. Show them that. Because the moment you get that purchase order, the moment you get that check, the moment, the moment that you get that payment in the door, you start delivering the goods. You start strategizing. You start, you know, mind mapping. Well, here's how the process is going to look like. And here's the delivery. And here's the installation. And here's what it looks like for your new client onboarding. And here's how we're going to do this. Why don't you do that before you get the check? And you will start to get a lot more checks. So literally treat prospects like clients and you will get a lot more clients. So, I mean, there's just a whole bunch of things that I think salespeople are either they're afraid to do or they're not. They don't have the inner certainty or the confidence to do. And if we just embrace this, take all the sales pressure off and literally adopt the mantra as a professional salesperson, you've got nothing to hide and nothing to prove, nothing to hide and nothing to prove. You're going in. I mean, you're going in like the Avengers, right? You are bulletproof. You are a superhero. You got your cape going on. Nothing can hurt you. And you got nothing to prove and nothing to hide. And the tone and the flow of the sales conversations that come from that mindset are completely different than when you're worried about pitching and pushing and selling and coming in with your spec sheets and your order forms and, and I hope they buy, I hope they buy, I hope they buy. One of the mantras that I share in the book is don't be, don't be concerned about the right, I'm sorry, don't be concerned about the right prospects saying no. Be very concerned about the wrong prospects saying yes. Because those are going to be the nightmare customers from hell. Uh, and so if you go in with a qualifying mindset that you're qualifying them just as much as they're qualifying you, and I show you how to do that and how to structure that, uh, it is a completely different peer-to-peer, human-to-human, much more enjoyable type of sales conversation. And and uh, and how do you how do you do that? How do you qualify well? How do you go in with that mindset and and increase your your sales uh, targeting the right prospects and rather than getting the wrong. Sure. Prospects well, so part yes. of it part of it is what I call the pre indoctrination. So way before they even first talk to you, what what do they see? What do they watch? What do they read? What have you sent as preparation? 
So one of the one of the philosophies in the do it selling book is engagement leads to involvement, involvement leads to conversion. So and we're not here it's not to play games, it's not like, you know, head games about hey, I'm better than you and I'm bossing you around. It is literally setting the stage for a collaborative sales relationship. So the prospect is no higher or lower than the salesperson and the salesperson is no higher or lower in status than the prospect. So, hey, before we meet, we have the six minute video. I think it'll be really helpful if you watch that six minute video before the meeting and maybe even in between meetings, between meeting one and meeting two, between meeting two and meeting three. Hey, here's a little short 10 question assessment. This will help shed some light on where you are compared to all your competitors. Take the assessment, send me the results, and then we can have a little 15-minute chat about it. So send them things to watch, send them things to read, send them things to do. And again, not heavy, not, not burdensome, helpful, useful, and insightful. This way, they show up on the first call already predisposed to buying from you. And then with every follow-up touch point, well, I took the quiz and we scored like a 6.7 out of 10. So that sucks. Uh, I did the assessment. I read this article. It looks like there's all kinds of things that we're not doing that we should be doing. So you don't need to stretch the gap between where they are and where, 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 where they want to be. Have your assets, have your value items do that for you. Because if they're not willing to engage, if they're not willing to watch a six-minute video, are they really a prospect? If they're not willing to answer 10 little quick one-liner quiz questions, are they really a prospect? If they're not willing to read a 500-word article, are they really a prospect? So the folks that, the folks that buy into your sales process are also the folks that will buy into your product and service. So wouldn't you want to find out early, oh, these guys are just tire kickers. They're just wasting my time. They just want that third bid because they always say, oh, hey, get three bids, and I guess we're number three, and they're not serious about talking to us anyway. Wouldn't you want to find that out early before wasting hundreds of miles and hours upon hours and upon hours of your life chasing with these people, meeting with these people, visiting with these people, only to realize, oh, they were stringing me along. They were stringing me along the whole time. So that, you know, disqualify early is absolutely one of the touchstones of a professional peer-to-peer -peer sales relationship. Makes sense. Qualification via pre-indoctrination and involvement. I love yes. it. Yes, 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 yes. And what about once someone is qualified, but, you know, maybe like we were talking about earlier, due to the economy, due, due to lots of things, they're not actually, even though they're qualified to do something, they're not actually doing anything. How do you get them to shift? How do you get a prospect to shift their mindset, mindset into, let's do this. I'm ready to do this. I don't just, I don't just agree with you that this is a good idea that I should do someday. And it's on number 10 of my to-do list that I'll get yeah. to in 2025. But how do you get them to shift into the moment? So we have a whole set of strategies and a whole set of sales questions that are based around the concept of now, now. And the now framework is, and it's subtle and it's way before you hit any objection. It's way before you hit any sort of, hey, let's revisit this in six months. Uh, from the very beginning, so let's say, Steve, you and I start this conversation. And uh, early in the conversation, after I say, hey, would it be okay if I treat you like a fee-paid client? And tell me about where this problem has been and where you are with it now. We'll spend the rest of our time talking about where we might go together. Uh, early in the conversation, I'm curious, Steve, is there something happening right now that is causing you to look into this? Uh, every time that you ask a question, you tag on the word now or right now. Is there a reason that your CEO is concerned about this now? Is there a reason that we have to you know, fix this problem now? I'm curious, why is getting a solution to this right now important to you? And 
you do it in, I'm, I'm emphasizing those words now vocally, you would just do it very naturally, right? I'm curious, did something happen right now that like, did you have a conversation with your CFO or is there some sort of, you know, emerging situation right now that is causing this to be a priority? So you're using now and right now throughout the conversation. And at the end, when they will typically give you the time objection, it's like, oh, this is a terrible time. Oh, Steve, it's our busy season. Oh, no, we couldn't possibly do anything until the spring. Uh, you know, we're, we're going to revisit this maybe next year. It's like you have so much evidence that you have collected. And, you know, this is like a courtroom attorney doing cross-examination that you never ask a question that you don't want the witness to hear themselves say out loud in court. And you could say, well, Steve, that's interesting because, you know, a few moments ago, you mentioned that your, your, one of your CEO's priorities is to fix this right now. And you also mentioned that you have this big board meeting coming up where he wants to be able to report some progress on this. And that it sounds like that board meeting is about six or seven weeks away. And you also mentioned that your whole team is about to move on to another project. So if you don't fix this now, it's probably never going to get fixed. Uh, when you say it's a bad time, I'm curious, tell me more about that, right? And then they're like, oh, right. So Robert Cialdini, the book Influence, right? People are very concerned about consistency. So if they said it was really important now, they said there's time factors, they said it's important to the CEO, they said that there's outside forces that are making them do this sooner rather than later, when they then say, no, this is a terrible time, you can genuinely say, I'm, I'm a little bit confused because you said A and B and C, tell me a little bit more. And you will, again, this is all about, it's not about manipulation. It's not about tricking them with their own language. It's about finding out what's really going on. What's really going on here? The sooner you find out what's really going on, the sooner you will start to make some real sales progress. But that's what I was saying about that layer of self-soothing delusions, arrogance, complacency. Sometimes it's BS. Sometimes it's outright lying. Not usually, because I think I'm a more positive person than that. But uh, you have to cut through those defense mechanisms. And one of the ways to do that is to ask a whole series of questions that gets them thinking in terms of now, 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 and now. Makes a ton of sense. That's... Uh... In that Robert Cialdini works, that, that's one of my favorite books uh, in sales that I've ever read, I think. So, so, so powerful, the, the concepts that he, the psychology of selling and, you know, the psychological concepts and why people, why, why do humans behave the way they do in these circumstances? Yes. Really, some really great frameworks in there that I, I, I just see come up over and over again throughout, throughout my career. It, it's a kind of a dense book, but definitely worth reading. He's got some other books that are a little bit more reader friendly, but of course, that's the original Bible of the uh, you know the whole in influence book. Yeah, yeah, I, I that was, it was required reading in business school. That was uh, they, I think it was a required book for a required class, so everybody had to read it. How about that? That's that's how important whoever designed that curriculum thought it was because it required right. like. 10 books, five books that were like that. But anyway, so, uh, well, let's go to the next stage then, uh, next in the, in the sales process. Let's talk about closing. I mean, you talked about how uh, one of the biggest problems with closing when people aren't good at it, it's often because of their lack of qualification. Um, but what about actual closing skills? What, what's your take on gaining commitment to, to seal the deal? Man, oh man, I listen, folks, you got to pull over. If you're on the road, you got to just pull over, <laughs> grab a notepad. You got to write these down. These are super complex, incredibly sophisticated, almost impossible to remember closing strategies. I'm going to lay them all on you now because, you know, when I'm on Steve's show, we got to over deliver. Here are some closing lines. You're all pulled over, right? You're not driving. Good. Okay, here we go. So, Steve, does this sound like something you, you'd like to do? So, Steve, does this, what we talked about so far, make sense? So, Steve, we have a couple of different paths forward. Which one makes the most sense for you right now? So, Steve, does this sound like something that we can work together on? So, 
obviously I'm kidding, I'm kidding that these are not complex. These are not sophisticated. These are not tricky. These are human to human, easy, natural, organic questions. I want you to think about it this way. Your entire sales process has been a beautiful seven course meal with the white tablecloth and the five kinds of wine glasses and the three kinds of forks and that little weird shaped knife that no one knows. Is this a fish knife? Is it a butter knife? What the heck is it? The answer is it's a fish knife, by the way. Uh, and so all of that has happened. The waiter comes up to you at the end and says, would you like coffee? Would you like dessert? Very few people in that restaurant would throw down their fork and say, how dare you? How assumptive of you. That's, I can't believe the arrogance. You're asking, would I like coffee? Would I like dessert? So here's the real deal. Some people want coffee and no dessert. Some people want dessert and no coffee. Some people want both. Some people want neither. No problem. Why is that question totally cool? Why is that question totally okay? Because it's a natural extension of everything that has come before. So when you say, so Steve, does this sound like something that you'd like to move forward with? So Steve, it's a green light for me. Is it a green light from you? You're literally asking because you've done all of the good work. You've done all the discovery. You've done all the qualification, all the disqualification. You've quantified and qualified and, and clarified the problem. You said, can you put a number on it? Can you put a number on it? Can you put a number on it? Because you've been strategically dumb and perpetually curious and everything is ready. For you to say, hey, it's a green light from me. Is it a green light from you? Does this sound like something that you'd like to work together on? Yes. Here's what they're going to say. Yes, no, or they're going to bring up any final questions or issues. But good prospects after a good sales process, they close themselves. You don't need to be manipulative or tricky or weird or pressure or artificial scarcity or fake deadlines or I'm taking away the discount. It's the takeaway close. <laughs> you don't need to do any of that crap. Uh, there's a, you know, there's a ton of sales books out there that teach all that old school nonsense. You know, mine is not one of them. Uh, I believe in human to human selling. And I think closing is a natural extension of everything that has come before. Makes a ton of sense to me. Um, next section, sales in 60 seconds. Quick questions, quick answers. What are some daily habits that all salespeople should have? Well, we touched on this a little bit earlier, but I'll, I'll put it in a different way. Put fresh targets on your radar daily because new blood is the lifeblood of your sales career. What's the best piece of advice you've received in your career? Stop procrastinating and get more into conversations. Nothing good happens outside of a conversation in sales. What would you say the most common mistake you see salespeople make? Not spending enough time selling. So true. How can salespeople overcome their own fears when speaking with clients? Stop speaking with clients and start asking clients great questions. When, you, when we're speaking, focus is on us. When we're asking, focus is on them. And there is no pressure, and it is a beautiful way to have a sales conversation. It's also a beautiful way to have a podcast. I, I hardly say anything. I just ask the questions around here. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you have... 77 instant action ideas that you mention in your book that salespeople can start using at any time to increase revenue. What is one of the 77 instant action ideas that you think is the most important that you'd like to share with us today? Uh, an early mentor of mine named Scott Simons said to me once, you're not doing enough MMA. And MMA is not mixed martial arts. MMA is money-making activity. And my spin on that in the Do It Selling book is about money-making activity is defined as direct to prospect activity, sending something, saying something, or doing something that will move you one step closer to a check. So I have totally embraced MMA and I shared this with all of my audiences and all of my clients that sales is really, sales success is really about MMA. So true. 
Well, I'm going to try to summarize all the wisdom that you've dropped on us here today. Um, so first, make enough time to properly prospect. Make sure you do the work to get the invitation to the conversation. Ask yourself, are you sending enough invitations to conversations to the right people? Open conversations in the right way with proper sales discovery. Ask questions during your discovery conversations out of genuine curiosity. And then when you have, when you have follow-up questions, um, use the word else. Who else? What else? Questions, questions, questions. Prospecting is all about research, relevance, and relationship. Answer for your prospects when you reach out. Why this? Why me? Why now? The right thing at the right time for the right person is absolutely vital to prospecting. Start your prospecting by researching for 15 minutes. Go to their website, look at their top executives, look at the business section of their local newspapers. What are they proud of? What are they worried about? Get your prospects talking by starting with, tell me a little bit about this problem. Where's that today? Where has it been? Where do you want to, where do you want to go? Where do you plan to go? The more you treat prospects like clients, the more clients you'll have. Don't just tell prospects, show them what it's like to work for you. Go into prospecting conversations with a mindset that you have nothing to hide and nothing to prove. Engagement leads to involvement. Involvement leads to convert to conversion. That's that's a key thing that I picked up from you today. I love that. Engagement leads to involvement. Involvement leads to conversion. Send your prospects things to watch, to read, or to do before the call to get them involved. You know, make them things that are helpful, useful, insightful, a short video, a short thing to read. Nothing crazy, but get them involved. Use the now framework to help you find out what's really going on with your prospects. To do that, you just basically tack on the world word now and right now to your questions. Early in the conversation, ask, is there a situation right now causing you to look at this or some version of that? And this will help you a ton during the closing process, right? So closing becomes easy. It's simple questions like, so does this sound like something you'd like to do? Does this sound like something you'd like to work on together? Um, because you've you've already shown that this is something that they can do right now, uh, the, and if you're if you're talking to the right people and you've you've qualified them right, good prospects close themselves. This has been so valuable, David. Where, where can our listeners read more about your work? Where can they learn more about you? How do they how do they reach out to you? Thank you, Steve. So a uh, couple of things. If they want to grab a copy of the Do It Selling book, it's simply doitselling.com. We also have a free PDF manifesto on our website, which is at doitmarketing.com slash manifesto. And uh, there's also a blog. We have the Selling Show podcast, which is at thesellingshow.com. So lots of free resources, uh, the book and all the free companion tools, downloads and training that come with the book are at Do It Selling, and that might be the more relevant place for our conversation today, but all kinds of other freebies on the website as well. Awesome. Well, this has been a great episode of the Outside Sales Talk. If you work in field sales, you'll love Badger Maps. The number one route planner helps you sell 20% more, drive 20% less, um, You know, right in line with uh, that sales efficiency and talking to, talking to people more, doing more selling activity that we talked about today. If you can think of any other sales reps out there that would benefit from learning about what David's taught us today, definitely forward this episode on to them. And, uh, you know, David, it's been fantastic to have you on the show, and I really appreciate it. Thank you, Steve. Um, it's great to be here. Take care until next time, everybody.